We are live. You're live with Laddick and Chris. Hello, everybody. We are a day earlier than we usually are simply because of my personal obligations. I'm unable to it. I'm unable to have office hours tomorrow because of those little ninos that and I have those three ninos, unfortunately. But what are you going to do? The ninos. Um, but we're still, you know, but we're still here and we're still going to talk about building a course. But again, I'm also a little displaced. It's weird, you know, we, we glamorize the digital nomadacy and we glamorize. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Holy grail. This is what everybody, yeah, absolutely. I totally do. Workers in the United States are like fighting I mean, to stay home from work. Okay, maybe they're not digital nomads, but they certainly are interested in, be, in remaining remote workers. Um, no, no, absolutely. And compared to the office commute, long commutes life, of course, it's, it's no. I don't want to go back to that. <laughs> I, I, th this is my lifestyle, but I'm not sure it's everyone's lifestyle um, yeah. because of reasons. <laughs> Me. Because, of re because of reasons. That's right. So true. Because of reasons. Maybe I should have joined on my phone. I have better, better quality. Anyway. Um, But we, you know what we want to talk about is building our course. Before we do that, let's remind everyone though that we have oh. the eLearn Success Series instructor session coming up on May fourth, which is in just two weeks and change. So it's really it's two weeks in a day. If you're in Australia, it's actually two weeks uh, before the instructor session goes live. Got a bunch of cool speakers. We've got Nick Furman from University of Georgia. I like, I really like this guy. I'm very interested to see what he's going to talk about. I know that there's going to be animals involved, live animals. Which what? That's a shtick. Yeah. So yeah, get ready for it. But his TED talk has more than a million views uh, on on how to be a, how to be a better instructor, a better teacher. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, our keynote speaker is Kevin Kelly, um, talking about. Um, accessibility and adaptability and equity in, in you know achieving that in today's online education space um we've got vanessa Huron going to be talking about get this when maybe you shouldn't use digital to achieve your teaching objectives which i find very interesting we have thomas corner from who's the chairman uh chairperson of the moodle users association which breaking news Moodle has just released Moodle 4.0. For those of us who know us as, who used to know us in Moodle News and LMS Pulse, um, that's an interesting thing. Moodle 4.0 looks like it's going to be a true upgrade, but mm -hmm. yeah. that, it, Chris is penning an article right now to, to talk about all that, those features and updates. So it's pretty exciting about that. Um, who else are we about it? Our very own from Open LMS, uh, Michael Vaughn, will be joining us about using. Um, Accessibility as a design challenge for a course. Uh, we have Jess Corinne, who I absolutely love. She, we've had her on the hot seat before. She is from a company called Learnfully, talking about neurodiversity issues, especially executive functioning, uh, and how to work with that. What else do we have? Um, Amy? No, Amy's not. No. And we have. Um, we have but one. This we have one speaker that is not not yet named from one of our partners named Respondus. Um, but that will be mm -hmm. you know, that will be that Mr. Who are the four spin but you know let's let's also be you know put on the table we have very exciting third parts the this instructor session we're doing a little differently it's going to have three parts it's going to be a part in the morning eastern time it's going to be a part in the evening eastern time and then the next day going to be another part morning Easter time, and that's going to be specifically for speakers of Spanish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So who are the four speakers for the Spanish session? Yeah. So uh, opening the session is our friend Claudia Tovar. Uh, she's a, a doctor in uh, education, uh, and she works in uh, Ecuador's uh, USFQ. It's like the top university. Um, and she has done a lot of really groundbreaking work on things like uh, digital badges, 
uh, online communities for education, uh, internationalization programs. That's kind of the specialty of that university. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're actually working, uh, discussing if we can give uh, attendees like a digital batch sure. for attending uh, the session uh, that they, they can have on their Moodle, on their OpenLMS, or on their LinkedIn, just to show uh, around. Um, we then we have um, Sol Garcia, um, though that may be a to a joint session uh, from our friends at Pentec, uh, which are uh, uh, providers of technological solutions on uh, Moodle and many other systems, actually. Uh, and it's interesting because we we talk about instruction, but uh, the technology. Um, does require some uh, some uh, previous structures of understanding. And I think that's what her talk is going to be about. Like the things that you should be aware of before you jump into using the tool, and then what you do while you're using the tool. Um, so I think it's going to be very important. Uh, I think it's a, it's a set of topics that she uh, gets asked to a lot in her work by teachers. So hopefully it should be very interesting. Uh, and then we have like a two, a joint session of uh, what does it take to be a good instructor, like on on synchronous sessions. Mm. Uh, um, this uh, guys are from Mexico. The one is Paco Robledo. Uh, and the other one is called Ed Ray. His name is Adre, I forget his last name. But uh, it's funny because they, they've been like working together for a long time, uh, but Paco is a corporate guy and Adre is an academia, university hired guy. Uh, but we, we sort of, I sort of gave them the task to prepare a um, like a parallel presentation. So it should be interesting to see yeah. whether they agree, whether yeah, they disagree. Both the titles were gonna, like achieving a success in online learning, but then from the corporate perspective and then from the academic perspective, that's pretty cool. Yep, and yeah, all of them are like really, they know their stuff. <laughs> that's- We uh, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, does it, uh, does it bear uh, uh, reiterating? Because that's what I want us to be known for, like the quality of the people that we got. And I'm actually really proud of the efforts that we've gone through to get these people. 100%, 100%. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, in summary, come check out the instructor session of the either and success series. Um, two weeks from now, if you're if you're in the United States or the, the Western hemisphere, it's May 4th and 5th. If you're in Australia or Asia Pacific, it's May 5th and 6th. But that's really hard to communicate you know, you just got so basically we just we, we tell people it's on on May fourth at ten a.m. Eastern. Everybody else can figure that out. Um, tickets. We got to remind everybody though, tickets are free, so you can come. There is no charge to it. This is one of the beautiful things about Open LMS. We get to do things and put this knowledge out into the world. So come join us for that. Um, the thing that we're doing here in office hours though is equally as interesting, which is that we are attempting to build a course. Very slowly, but surely we are attempting to build a course. I mean, if we, you know, we could do it in, in, in you know, one one hour session, but we kind of really wanted to, to play this out and actually have a, have a thought piece around this. So we've had, let's see, uh, our first session was talking about, um, well, that's interesting. Um, our first session was talking about, um, the lenses the course the course itself right um or the idea of what the we're idea doing. This, we may i may actually have to have you share my friend because let's see does this work are we sharing now Ooh. yeah 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 <laughs> sorry my the the computer i was using was telling me that it wasn't going to do that um <laughs> thank god because i'm from my phone <laughs> and i don't know if i can do that i don't think that would have worked um, so anyway, so then, then the second, you know, so we walked about, just talked about the project and the second one we said, well, you know, what theme do we want to have? And we came up with, 
actually one of our colleagues came up with this awesome theme of the World Cup 2022 um, as a potential, you know, overarching topic for our course. Um, and then last, the last time we talked about this, we were brainstorming what could potential actual themes be or, you know, focus of the course be. Did we have, we have, we never actually chose one, did we? Um, not yet. And I don't know if it's the time now because, well, I kind of want to say what we were discussing just a couple of minutes before we started. Uh, uh, when I think the name of the course should be How to Win the World Cup. How to Win the World Cup. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that should lead us uh, to what is the outcome? I mean, how can we help people win the World Cup? And what do we mean by that? I mean, I say, what, I guess, does mean, what does it mean to win the World Cup? Does that mean that your country hosts the World Cup? It means that your national team gets the trophy at the end? It means that you, you know, what, like, what does it mean? Exactly. What does it mean? <laughs> and depending on what that means, we should talk about what, how can we make sure that we can deliver on that, on that meaning. <laughs> um, so, I mean, straight, the best way, uh, you know, I, I started to look into like some YouTube videos that were had that name and there was a couple that had that title, How to Win the World Cup. Um, and they touch on things here and there. Um, but I don't see something that gives you a picture of what it takes to win the World Cup. So mm -hmm. the way I see it, I mean, and and I wasn't really thinking what you just mentioned, but I think it's really important. Uh, it's not just about uh, the player from a team who lifts the cup at the end of the of the of the whole event. Uh, but it could be other things, could be winning uh, a location, could be like for my country, but it's not going to be this year, but for many countries, winning is achieving like a historical record, not necessarily the top, uh, like the cup itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny because we don't even, we don't even dream about it, even though we love soccer. Um but uh, it could also be how to win or how to make the most of the World Cup as a company or as a, I don't know, an executive. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. just, uh, I mean, from, a, like, from a community standpoint, like winning at the World Cup, well, then we say, is, is it the hosting community or is it the community that sends a team? Ooh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know what it, you know what constitutes that community itself right like i mean there's 350 almost 400, 400 million people in the united states and we're definitely fielding a team we actually got into you know we got past the qualifying around this year i wonder how many of how many of my country people would uh would actually even first of all know that the world cup is going on and two i mean how many of them can name any of the players you know uh that kind of thing. So like what, you know, what is the, what's the, I probably, we would probably be surprised actually. I mean, probably a lot more than we think, but um, in a large country like the United States, like what does, you know, what sort of weight does this, does this carry? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But are you, are you saying that maybe winning for the U S or countries like yours is to make the sport, to bring more awareness to the sport to what the local team is doing, the national team is doing. Well, I think the way that the United States would prefer to do that is to just actually win the cup. Right? I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, that would be the that would be the most important lightning rod. But that's a very interesting question, because I don't think anybody thinks the US is going to win. But that would be a very fair question. What does it take for the US to win the World Cup? Um, Ooh, that is a really interesting question. And I mean, there are some things that you cannot do, like in a club. Like if you have a club like Real Madrid, you can buy whoever you want from anywhere. You cannot do that in the US. You can, however, choose a very good uh, coach. Uh, then you can 
use, uh, I don't know, technology to your advantage, research? Yeah, and then you also, I mean, you just had the, the, uh, just had the investment. Like, my, I mean, investment, but the funny thing is that you, I mean, there is a relationship between money and and the ability to win, but it's not that straightforward. And you see, like, why why does Latin America have so many more uh, records of victories at the cup throughout history than, uh, say, uh, Northern Europe, like any country that's not Germany, Italy, yeah. uh, maybe a little bit France or England. A lot of these countries are really wealthy countries, but they don't they don't stack up to Argentina, Brazil. Sure, mm -hmm. agree. Why is that? Why is that? So maybe is what is it? Is it culture an ingredient? You need to build that culture before in order to win the World Cup. <laughs> um, but you like have you have like dynamically opposing cultural contexts in the place like Brazil as opposed to Germany, right? Exactly, right. that's true as well. You know, I mean. Mm. or the uk right so what what would be the cultural factor in those countries like why would germany be a dominant world player in the same league as brazil using that criteria but it's funny that maybe we end up to the place that we were before like i guess the only thing that i can think of that they all have in common is their their fans like really vocal fans. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, Colombia has really great fans and doesn't have all that uh, acumen. How much how much information is out there about the fans? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I'm just wondering what if we what if we focus our course on, you know, something to do with that is not the game, not the players, not the, you know, the, but, but like the good, the bad, and the ugly about the fans. Like understanding the fans? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even, I, I mean, I'm, again, I'm just, I'm trying to brainstorm here about what could we do in this particular, well, using this particular topic. But, you know, I mean, I don't want to change the title, although we're very, very early on, but uh, I do see there could be a link between understanding the fan base in order to win the World Cup. Uh, because the way I see it, there's things like, I mean, when there is a really vocal fan base, there's a lot more eyes into what goes into it. Uh, but then culture plays a role. Uh, but funnily enough, uh, but Latin America has a lot more issues with things like corruption, bureaucracy, that Europe, for example. But the passion and the interest and the fervor uh, for the, those things to do really well uh, go to the point where the people who run like the team, the federations, and so on, they have a really strong incentive to be uh, very transparent and be very um, judi judicious with the use of resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of the fans, because of the oversight that fans mm -hmm. play. Uh, unfortunately, in countries like Colombia, there is a lot of fervor, a lot of passion, but I don't know, we are kind of used to corruption and we don't really like maybe at like deep down we don't really believe we we have uh, what it what it takes although today everyone's pissed because we do have like really good players uh, so why didn't do better why, why didn't we do better and i think i mean I, I i don't know if that's going to lead to changes but uh, the fans are mad so yeah. maybe they will. Mm. 
So it's interesting. I don't know. I'm thinking a lot of things about fans and community and transparency in a in an organization towards a goal. Uh, and you know, I, I'm also thinking that yes, we are talking about uh, creating a course about soccer, but we should also be able to maybe a little here and there during these sessions uh, and step a little bit back and to say why are we doing why are we moving forward this way to the to our goal of building the course if that makes sense try that last part again i don't think i understand that last part like i think we should uh we should find moments during these streams where we take a step back and we say oh why why did we have this discussion how does this help us in our in our own the two of us goal of building a course uh, or is it something that should be left to the viewer um, i don't see why we can do a little bit of both like show what we do but also try to think like why are we doing it this way mm. For example, you just mentioned that uh, yeah. we were taking it slow, which I didn't know we were <laughs> necessarily. It seems so like we're, right. we're, three, we're three weeks in. I mean, if this were just you or I, we could have banged this out in 24 hours. Well, I mean, 30, 24 hours straight, that's like 48, 30 minute sessions or like. Hmm. I guess what's you know what's what's interesting. I I don't mean to to, to I'm going to curve the topic. Okay. Is what, what's interesting to me is that what has dawned on me here is that one of the things that we advocate about, at least I advocate all the time, is that we need to rethink how we are delivering material in the online space, rather than thinking about you know, taking a class that you have and just putting it online. It's about using and leveraging the platform that you have in order to deliver the educational experience. But in our case, I think we're going to be kind of limited in those choices because ultimately we're going to build this and it sounds like we're going to find ourselves in like a self-paced course kind of outcome. Does that sound about right? I mean, Ultimately, other because we don't, you know, how would we have or will we have, you know, synchronous moments where we have an expert or, or, or an instructor actually talk? Will we have, like, what kind of assessments would we have in this course in terms of having students connect with one another? That's really, those are all very interesting things, right? Yeah. And I, I don't know, man, because I, I was checking this really long podcast uh, with Mark Zuckerberg. And you can hate him or whatever, but he he has a clear head. And he, the way he described like the metaverse and the challenges that are ahead, it was like really like oh, I mean it's 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 the deepest uh, look at the metaverse that I've seen. Like most articles tend to be really shallow. Flip it. Uh, so I was wondering why can why can we build something that may not why can't we build something for the metaverse, like a course? Why, why won't this course end up in the metaverse? It doesn't have to be the first version. It doesn't have to be the only place where it ends up. But can we at least think of the possibilities enough so we are we keep we keep things flexible hmm. and, and, and fun <laughs> and, and entertaining? Because I think that's another key issue of of the metaverse or of this online space, uh, how can, how can, I don't know, I think I've thought a lot about uh, parties, like can, can we make learning a party? Uh, is it online? Is it, we, we even joked the other time, why don't we have a, but don't we build a course and at the end of the course, whoever wants to take it, they got to meet us in Mexico City or Cancun mm -hmm. and and they take the course for a week. And this is the planning and the invitation itself. 
So I, I don't see that we need to end up doing what, uh, well, anything really. We, <laughs> but but I, went, I do want to end up with something. Yeah, of course. Got, I want to have some, I want to have a tangible outcome. I want to have something that's like I can point to and say, this is what we did. See, there it is. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to see how it was done, join us every Wednesday, Wednesday or ish, usually ish. <laughs> yeah. So what? Okay. So then, then, all right, I'm, I'm game. So ha, ha, literally I'm game. So take me back to the world cup. Mm -hmm. Like I'm looking at our topics, like, what are we going to, what will people know? What's the outcome? What's the, well, how about this? How about we, the behavior that's changed? What is it? How about we look into the topics that you listed and we decide whether those are useful or not in order for for someone who takes this course to win the World Cup? Let's see. Having a history of the World Cup, I'm not going to say that'll get you to where you're winning it. How's a player get on it's to a good World Cup too. national team? Yeah, I think that's important. Well, I mean, if you want to say, you know, in order to win, you're going to, you know, have to know some history. I would in fact, you would throw a session in there about history. From discovery to world champion, the overview of a football career. That could be winning. Yeah, actually, I, and another. <laughs> go ahead. It's funny because uh, in, in here in Colombia, we are like mourning the death of a really uh, important player in our history. He died at 55 years old from a car accident. Oh, no. um, and I was reading an interview that he made in 2013, and he was he was talking a lot about all these things where there's a mixture of or a family that supports you, uh, but then you find a lot of people who just don't really believe or care about you until you end up with the people who end up becoming your sponsors, your mentors, and give you the chance for you to show who you really are. Uh, but uh, it's it's not, I mean, you cannot help wondering, uh, are, are, is the system built in such a way that we let the absolute best through uh, come through up up the ranks and so on uh the, seems like there's quite a few hurdles um on the on the like on the career on the path on the hierarchy and so on but then there's also like the personal side of you need to believe from a really early age that you are going to be worthy of being or joining the national team or becoming a renowned soccer player uh, in some countries more than others because mm -hmm. he, I mean, he he well I, I don't know how much to to believe what he was saying but he was very insisting on I never lost like confidence of who I wanted to become where I wanted to play what I wanted to do how I wanted to win mm. So I guess it's, it is important. Uh, and I guess it is important to know how to win and to know why maybe you don't win. One of the things I love about these conversations is they get so deep so fast. I'm not even sure how to respond to that. <laughs> well, well, let's keep going down the list. How does a country get selected to host the World Cup? I'm not sure how relevant that is, or how, how do you see it? I kind of really like that one. Like, I think it's very like going through the, you know, the that that's a little bit of the history of the World Cup. That's a little bit of the process behind, you know, how the World Cup becomes a thing, much like the Olympics, right? Where, you know, a city has to host it or a country has to host it. And then 
there's all kinds of investment and there's a time frame, usually 10 years or so before you actually, the, the cup actually shows up. Um, for no, you. And, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I know that being the host of the world cup is when it's a very powerful factor for you to win. Um, like England won when, when they hosted France won when they hosted, um, the U S didn't win, but he had a really good showing. So I guess, yes, it is important. <laughs> and historically, it's important. It's really f interesting when a really strong team is the host. So it's like, oh, it's, it's his cup to lose. Mm -hmm. And then they go ahead and lose it and everyone just goes wild. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like like what happened in Brazil. What's the, what's the best that the U.S. has ever done? We got into the round of eight? It's a good question. No, I think they actually have a, like a fourth place or third place okay. a long time ago. That's I can't believe I know all these facts. <laughs> I was say you are you're for a man who says that he doesn't doesn't follow this stuff. You sure you seem to have a lot of a lot of knowledge. I love trivia, I love trivia. Maybe that's why. I like these these alternative outcomes resulting from the World Cup. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that the, the the there are two losses by Brazil that are like historic. Uh, I don't know if that's what you mean, like things that are crazy um, and crazy things that players do. There's been a couple of those. Like what? Uh, the, I guess the most popular is Maradona's uh, Hand of the God, where he basically scored a goal with his hand and nobody saw it. I mean, everyone saw it except the, the referee. Everyone, um, everyone except the referee. <laughs> and and for, uh, I mean, if I think if I would think what would make a gr uh, soccer player great, I wouldn't think just because he once uh, made a goal. It was a really important goal, if I remember correctly. Um, but everyone went insane, and he's revered for that one goal. Uh, he made a ton, a lots of goals in his life, and much more uh, uh, like better, better related to their sure mm -hmm. to their skill. <laughs> yeah, um, there's also like this guy, this Sidan, a French soccer player. He kicked another player with his head on the chest. On a, on a final and he got expelled and another one beat uh, an Uruguayan player beat the ear of another player. Oh, I remember that one. That was pretty, that was, yeah, that was recent. <laughs> that one was recent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's always these ranks of the best goals and things like that. Hmm. Does it help you? Does knowing that help you win the World Cup? I I don't see it. Like you do have to know how to keep your team in check in a way. Because I guess the question is if you want to know how to win the World Cup, you have to look back at past winners. I guess is past prologue is the question. Um, and say what what was what were the factors about these winning teams that allowed them to win? Yeah, and sometimes you are really another thing that I guess it's it's always asked is how lucky is the winner? How fair? I was going to say, at what point? At what point? In every story, at some point, you're going to have to pull out the luck card. Yeah, and there's a lot of those. Like, In fact, for a long time in Colombia, um, people kept saying it was this player, Jepes. So it was Era Gol de Jepes. Mm -hmm. the, some player named Jepes made a goal, but the referee annulled it. And in that game, Colombia 
uh, was out of the cup and in their in their best showing which was quarterfinals mm. so for many years and i think you tell that to some people in colombia no era gol de era gol de jepes and people are going to say yes it's true Mm -hmm. A lot of things like get burned into your memory. I don't know. Where were you when Jeppe scored the goal or missed the goal? Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering. So, if we were to take the last five champions. How many years back would that go? Would that go back 25 years? 25, including this year? Well, we, we don't know who's going to win this year, so. <laughs> so I guess 23, 24, yes. But then if you uh, take, let's just say we, let's just look, I'm, I'm trying to think of the realism of putting this. So, so if you take the last five World Cup champions, and you say, what were the factors that led to them winning the World Cup? Yeah, I, I, can, I can picture like a matrix of factors. Luck probably at the top or <laughs> very big one, but... Well, I'm just wondering, all can of you the... also could, could be... Well, I'm just thinking of how would you present this as a course for someone to consume, like a learner to consume, right? So you would, let's just say we take the top, you know, the last five winners of the World Cup, and then we present that story of why maybe we could how they, how they how they won or how they got there i don't know i mean i'm the way I, i'm starting to see like that this that that story like that history that you mentioned told through different lenses so there's the lens of who was the coach uh, what what do do all these five coaches have anything in common or are they just wild in terms of themselves their background their formation and so on and in terms of their strategies uh, their approach to the game their in-game decisions for example uh, then of course the team would be another story what do all these teams have in common do they get along do they not uh, does it depend on one or two like cracks that just take the whole team or or is that definitely too much to ask um uh, and then the fans mm -hmm. <laughs> how are the fans for the team uh, was the team the host i think in the case of france it was um i don't know i just i and I, I guess my question here is how conventional do, do we want our discourse to be in terms of I don't, I don't, I sections? Think, I don't think it necessarily has to be the conventional at all. I'm actually really kind of cottoning to this idea. Um, I guess, what is it that we want to show off in terms of how impressive online learning can be in terms of sharing of content, assessing, uh, Assessing um, behavior change or skill, or, or sorry, or or retention or or acquisition of knowledge, um, in terms of connecting people, in terms of uh, those kinds of things. I I like it. I, I personally like it. Let's let's see if we can beat it up a little bit more. But I think we've kind of we've kind of kind of come to our time and office hours here. But I like this. So right now where we're at is how do you win the World Cup? and we take the last five winners mm -hmm. and ultimately each one becomes its own module of what's the story of how this team won the world cup through selection to qualifying to the group round to you know what factors played in and we basically we uh, we're trying to ask the question is how much how much how big is the luck card right how big is the chance card like which one i'd love to know like it, 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 you know of the last five winners how many of them were predicted to be the winner for example you know by mm -hmm. by your sources by betting you know like go to vegas go to uh, 
uh, Macau or whatever, you know, where the, the big betting places and say, oh yeah, this year definitely Brazil's going to win. And they were right. Um, right. How many of them lost like a key player along the way and yet still came out, you know, or maybe several key players along the way and still came out on top? How many of them had a fortuitous event like the hand of God, you know, like how many of them had an event like that that took them to the championship? And there's a lot of really cool, yeah. cool things to answer. And- yeah, and the, the money, of course. Like, how much money did each team have? Sure. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. What's, that, what's the salary cap on each of the teams, you know? that. That's Yeah, that's a whole how other have, thing. Cause... How have the rules changed, or how have things changed over the last 25 years uh, in terms of rules and technology? There's been, there's been a lot of that, yes. Which kind of muddies oh. the water, like because we don't, we, we're not gonna get like, we're gonna get a lot of data, but I, I worry that each circumstance may be too different for a good comparison. So ah, something you, like you stumbled into the great seminar class, my friend. That this is this is the great <laughs> seminar class. This is not how do you you know get a precipitant you know, by dripping your chemical into the beaker, you know, like this is not going to be like, what's the chemical reaction? This is going to be messy and dirty social science, humanities kind of class. Mm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Feels like you're savoring it. Well, you know, this is, this is the stuff that college kids, which is who I have in my head, you know, this is what keeps you up at night, right? You want to be able to, Sit around and chew the fat for a while. Yeah, let's chew the what, fat. What's what's what, the question? What school is this going? To, is, is this like sports science? Is this physical education? Is this history? Is this economics? Is this? Mm. Just, <laughs> it's, it's never not. It's never not economics. <laughs> it's never <laughs> not economics. The economics. No, I'm just kidding. It's just. I know you because we're known for saying. Yeah, you, know, you know that I am an economist as well. What? My first degree is an economic degree. <laughs> no way. Yeah, it is. No. Wow. So you are like. It just happens to be <laughs> agriculture economics. Oh my God. Econometrics. Econometrics. Oh. There is a lot of socket econometrics out there too but will that help us no <laughs> probably not all right i will uh we will we'll find you again next week on the office hours with open lms with chris and Latic. uh but until then go sign up for the e-learn success series instructor session because it's in two weeks so how do you win the world cup a seminar and dissection of the last five world cup winners what are the factors that cause what what are the factors that lead to winning the world cup yeah or or losing i mean well in in their case they all won yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah good afternoon chris (laughs) bye bye everyone